XLOOKUP. So in this video, we're going to cover XLOOKUP function in Excel and Google Sheets. So it's been available in Excel for over a year now. It is now also available in Google Sheets. There it is. It's popping up. So if you try and you see it's not available in Google Sheets for you, it may take a couple of weeks for it to actually show up. XLOOKUP is a function that is going to do something similar to what VLOOKUP or index and match functions do. If you're familiar with those functions, you already know the concept of what this function does. It's basically a more simplified version of those alternatives. And you should be able to use that in Google Sheets. You should be able to use that on office.com, which is basically online version of Excel, which is the same as newer versions of Excel. For example, if you have 365, you should be fine. So the purpose of an XLOOKUP is to be able to search for a value in a column. So if you look at this example, we got this product name column. We might want to search for a particular product in this column. Like in this case, there's this example of searching and finding this Nike running shoes product. And then once you find the match, then you go and pick some item in the same position. So in this case, we get the price matching this particular product. And this is what we call an exact match lookup. So you search a column, you find a match, you go grab the results from another column from the same position where the match is. There are other type of lookups other than exact match, and we'll go over other types of match types that are available in XLOOKUP but we're basically gonna take it step by step. So let's start with exact match, see how it works. So if I go to this lookup exact tab right here, in this example, we got this product name column. So if I enter a product name, I'm just gonna copy this Adidas running shoe and paste it here. So here I want to be able to find matching price for this product. So the way that would look like, you would do equals X lookup, you would point to this product name, look up value, basically what you're trying to find, comma. Then we got what's called lookup array, which is gonna be a single column in our case. So it's gonna be these values right here. And essentially what I'm saying, I'm saying let's try to search this product name in this range of product names, comma. And then the last required argument in this function, which is this without square brackets is return array, which is the column from which you're gonna return the results. So for example, if I select these prices, close parentheses, and hit enter, that should get me my matching price for this product. And essentially what should happen if I enter a different product name in the cell, that should automatically now search for this product name in this column, find this Nike running shoes. And from that same position from this range, it's going to return 9431, which as you can see, it did no problem. Some things to remember when you do the lookup array and return array, they have to be the same size. So this first range I did from line two to line eight. And this second range is also from line two to line eight. You don't want to have a situation where you select, let's say the header in this range, but not select the header in this range. And as you can see, I get a value error because I have mismatch of range sizes. So you will see people include the header in both. That's fine too if you wanna do that, even though technically, if you want to be 100% accurate, it should not include the header but it's not a big deal. So the other thing to note is that range sizes could technically be the same if I do something like this. See, this is the same number of rows compared to this, even though they're not starting in the same row. And if I'd enter, this will return something. And as you can see, it returns a zero. To explain you what's happening here, I'm gonna just change this back to Adidas. So you can see now what's happening, it's returning 148.97. And the way that happens, 
Within this first range, Adidas running shoes is in the second position. So therefore, from the second range, we get the item from the second position. And starting from here, the second position is this. So that brings us 148.97. And this is the reason why when I used to have Nike running shoes here, that would return a zero because essentially we end up selecting this position from this range would be this empty cell. So that gets a zero for us. So I'm gonna go back to just selecting the range. So the way this would make sense if this would be exactly in the same spot for both ranges. And if I hit enter, that should work just fine. So let's just talk about different pieces in this three arguments that you should know. So let's start with this lookup value. So lookup value is the item we're trying to find. And this is not case sensitive. So even if I do lowercase Nike, we should be able to find a match here. However, it's sensitive to pretty much anything else you could think of. So for example, if this was Nike running shoe instead of Nike running shoes, there would be no match because these are two different things. This applies to anything, including commas, periods, any other characters. So every character must be the same. Some situations that are hard to spot. So for example, you could potentially have a space after the word shoes here. And if you look at these, they would look similar, but because of that extra space here, now we get no match. We get an error, no match basically. Now, if I remove that space, it will find a match. So just know this only works if every character is exactly the same. The second thing you should know about lookup functions like xlookup, vlookup, match, all those functions is that they only find one match. For example, if I change this Nike running shoes to new balance, I have two possible matches here in this range, but my lookup function will not be able to find both. It will only find the first match, which is gonna be this one. And based on that, it's gonna return the first match, which is this price. And that's it. Every second, third, fourth match is gonna get ignored. So if you're trying to find multiple matches, there are other solutions like filter function and things like that, which I have videos that cover those. But this is only a single match. Then we have the lookup array, this one. So lookup array can either be a single column as a range or a single row as a range. The function is xlookup, it can actually do both directions. It can search a column and return results from a column, or it can actually search a row and get results from a row. Now, most of normal data is structured in columns like this. So therefore you usually end up doing this. I will probably give you an example of that row search later as well. Now, finally, return array can either be a single column or it can be a range of multiple columns. So to give you an example here, if I select this instead of just column price, if I hit enter, I'm gonna get the results from both price and cost at the same time. So return array does not have to be a single column, it can also be multiple columns like this. So now if I select these three, it's gonna return stock number, price, cost in that particular order. I'm gonna go back and just point to price column for now. So to recap, generally speaking, if you're trying to use something like an X lookup, you want to make sure that the column in which you search does not have any duplicate matches. So this should be a list of unique items unless there's some particular specialty case when you're just trying to find the first match. Otherwise, technically, you shouldn't really have multiple possible matches in your lookup array range. So let's do another quick example here. If I have, for example, this stock number, copy paste it here. If I wanted to find matching price for the stock number, then I'm gonna do equals X lookup, point to the stock number that I'm trying to find, comma, then lookup array would be coming from this range because we're gonna find that stock number in this list of stock numbers, comma. And then if I want the return to be price, I would just select 
this column right here, close parentheses, hit enter, and that should give me the match, which is the accurate price for this particular stock number right here. Now, what's also nice about XLOOKUP is because since these are separate ranges, your return array can really be from anywhere. So if I wanted to get product name based on that stock number, I could just select my return array to be product names. And therefore it's gonna return matching product name for this particular stock number ending with 374, just like that. So this concludes most of basic things you need to know about XLOOKUP. However, there is one more thing you should be aware about is that when you do a search using lookup functions like XLOOKUP, not only the value has to be exactly the same as the matching value, but the type must be the same as well. So let's do a quick example of that. I'm gonna go to this lookup exact type match. And here we have this ID five, and I'm trying to find matching price from this source table. So right now, if I do X lookup, point to this lookup value five, comma, select these IDs, comma, and then return range to be this. If I close parentheses, hit enter, you'll see I get an NA, no match, not because our formula is inaccurate, but because this five is a number and this five is text. Now, if you're in Excel, Excel usually gives you this green warnings that even though this looks like a number, it's really text. And the way you would basically make this work, you either convert both of these to text or both of them to numbers. So for example, if I select all of these up here, click on this warning sign and convert them to actual numbers, because these are numbers and this is a number, this will match. The same thing applies with dates. If you have text dates and actual dates, they will not match. Either both have to be text dates or both have to be actual dates for them to match. So as you can see, we got our match after this. Now this conversion in Google Sheets is a little different. So if I just grab this same XLOOKUP function, go to Google Sheets, let's go to that same tab, and I just paste it here, you'll see I also get an NA exactly the same way we got an NA in Excel, so everything works exactly the same way, there is really no difference, except that in Google Sheets we don't get that warning for our numbers, and the way we convert those to a number is by simply just going here and doing number as a format. So if I just do this, it will actually handle the conversion to a number. And usually what I like to do after I do this, because I don't want this decimal points, I would just go back to automatic. But now they're actually numbers and these are numbers. So this actually works. Now in Excel, you can't just go like this and do a number to convert it to a number. It will not work. So if I tried doing the same thing, if I undo to get back to this, if I selected these and go here and do number, it would not convert it to a number because in Excel, this doesn't do any conversion. It only just changes the display format. That's the reason why here I had to make sure I convert it to an actual number here and then it works. But the logic is the same. The type of the value must be the same or it's not a match and it's not gonna work. So now that we know these, let's get to an example of how we actually use XLOOKUP on real daily tasks. Because these examples I just did, those are not really what you do using these functions when you do things at work. Now for that, let's go to this join data to start with some very basic and small example of how you actually apply these functions. So most of the time when people end up using XLOOKUP, the reason for that is because they have two separate tables that have a common unique identifying column. And then using that column, you want to be able to go grab some information from the other table that does not exist in your original table. So in this particular example, we got this tiny two tables and both of them have this unique stock number column 
in both of those tables. And what I want to do, I want to go get matching prices from my second table to my first table using XLOOKUP. The way this would look like if we did not use XLOOKUP, we would have to manually go find the match for this 590, which in this particular range would be this one right here. And we would basically just copy this and point to this cell. Then we would take this one, find it in this particular range, copy the matching price, paste it here, and then find this next item, five to four, go in this cell, copy this and paste it here. As you can see, this is not a very efficient way of handling this. If you have 10 lines, you could probably do this. But if you have hundreds of items, this would be pretty much impossible task. So we handle this using XLOOKUP. And what you want to remember is that our initial XLOOKUP is just gonna get the first copy and paste. So the first copy and paste would be this 590 item. So that would be this item right here. So I want to just solve this price for this first stock number. So if I approach it like that, basically if I just picture as if none of these existed, so I'm just gonna make this color white so we cannot see them. So if I only had this first stock number and I wanted to get the price, that would be pretty much the same thing I've been doing this entire time. So I would just go here and do an X lookup. I would point to the stock number, the first one, comma. Then I would go here, select this range of stock numbers from this other table, comma, and then the range from which I'm gonna get my results. Assuming that's gonna be prices, it's gonna be that column price. I'm gonna select this, hit enter, and that should return the accurate price. Now let me just bring these back. And by that, I just mean, I'm just gonna color them in a way so that we can see them. There we are. So now we wanna get all of these matches, right? The results for the rest. So what we can do now, we can just drag this formula down. Now, if I just take this formula the way it is without making any changes and just drag this formula down, you will see that even though this works for some lines, it also doesn't work for other lines. And if we look, for example, at this line, that ends with 839, that would be this stock number over here and we didn't find a price. So if we check this formula and see what happened, you will see that the ranges that this formula is pointing to, it doesn't start from the top of this table on the right, it starts from like this position of the table. And what's happening here is that because we have relative references for these two ranges right here, this range and this range, as we drag our formula down, those ranges are gonna move down. So if I check the next line, you'll see both of them moved a row lower than they used to be. And then the next line down, they now moved two lines lower than they used to be. And at some point, by the time we're here, we just moved too much down and we're not searching the majority of our range anymore. So we get this problem, there's no match. So what we wanna do, we wanna make sure that these ranges are absolute reference so that they don't move together with the formula. And the way we do that, we go back to this first formula and we use absolute ranges for this first two ranges up here. And you could just manually do this by adding dollar signs for each column and each row, or we can just highlight this and press F4 key on our keyboard. Some keyboards you have to press Fn key, the function key to get to your F4, but it's the same thing even if you're on a Mac. So F4 key. So you can see how I got my dollar signs. So I know this worked. So I'm gonna hit enter. Now that's not gonna update these formulas, even though I changed my first formula. So to update the rest, I'm gonna click on the first formula again, go to this little box in the corner and drag it down one more time. And you will see that this now works. We get our matches. We still get an NA for this. But the reason for that is because if you check for this item, that starts with 3120 over here, it just doesn't exist. So if it doesn't exist, you get that NA, which is accurate. That's the way that should work. So that's how you perform an XLOOKUP. So generally speaking, when you do XLOOKUP, 
these ranges would be always absolute reference unless there is a particular reason to use a relative reference. Those cases happen very rare. So by the time you actually need this to be relative, you will know that. I would recommend just do absolute. And then when it's time to not do absolute, you will know that. So that's how we do a basic XLOOKUP from two tables to grab some data from one table and move it over to this other table. Now, most of the time when you do this sort of thing, you don't usually have your tables next to each other, even though they could be, but mostly your tables would be located on different tabs. So let's just go ahead and delete these from here. And now these don't work because there's no data. So I'm going to clear all of that. So let's do an example of that. We have a tab over here called join data. We have another tab down here that's called other tab, which is basically that second table I used to just have a second ago. And I'm going to grab those prices from here again and move them over to this join data tab up here. So basically I'm going to do the same thing, except that my source table is now located on a different tab. And this is not going to be really that different. So we just do equals X lookup. We point to the first item in this list, comma. Then we have our lookup array, which is the column or the first range in which we're going to search this item. So we're going to go to that other tab after the comma, and we're going to point to this range right here. Now you want to watch your formula up here in a formula bar, what happens to your formula as you do this. And then I'm going to continue. So I'm going to do a comma and it's going to be return array, which is going to be a column or a list of columns from which you want to get your results. Now, in my case, it's just a single column. I'm just going to highlight price. But if you wanted to get price and cost, you could have just selected both of these like that. I'm only going to select prices like this, this range. And then at this point, I'm just going to close parentheses while staying in the formula bar, hit enter. And that returns me back to my original tab and grabs my matching price. Before I drag this formula down, I'm going to make sure that these two ranges are absolute reference. So I'm going to select both of these, press F4. That gets me the dollar signs, hit enter. And then we're going to drag it down, which we can do by going to this little box, click and drag, or just double click on that little box to basically match this column on the left. So we did so, as you can see, we got our results and we get an NA up here. So that's the practice of doing a basic X lookup. Now, one other thing I want to mention here, I'm going to just copy the same exact formula, hit escape, paste it right next to it like this. X lookup can also handle arrays. So usually one way we can do this, we can just do this, right? The way I did this and then drag the formula down to get the results for all the other lines, which works just fine. But you could also as a lookup value here, select this array, meaning this first range of lookup values. And because it's an array here, it's going to return all those results. So I didn't have to drag it down. As you can see, it will handle the array here and do the match for each one of those and just spill the results as the array. Now for Google Sheets, let's see if this works by default or we have to do an array formula. It's possible that in Google Sheets, we have to do an array formula. So we're going to copy this, go back to Google Sheets, which is right here. So I'm just going to paste that same formula right there, hit enter. And I'm going to reject this suggestion. As you can see in Google Sheets, it was basically just suggesting to drag this formula down, but I didn't want to do that. So if you want this to work as an array formula in Google Sheets, you do have to add array formula wrapper, which you can do by doing control shift enter or command shift enter like this, or you can just type array formula function around this whole X lookup. And if I hit enter, see, it will spit out all those results. Everything else would be working the same way, except that if you decide to use an array for this lookup array, you want to make sure that you do array formula in Google Sheets.
getting back to this. So now we know how to do this. I'm gonna actually not do array formulas on this, but for those of you who know arrays, you should be able to use this just fine with arrays, as you can see, no problem. But that's a different topic and you can watch my array formula videos to see how that works. For this, we're just gonna do a regular formula, drag it down, it finds our matches. Now, let's move on to some other arguments we have for this function. So the first three required arguments were lookup value, lookup array, and return array. So we already talked about those, we know how those work. Now the next part here is this if not found, and that's optional. So the default behavior is that if something is not found, like this, we get an NA, you may want to customize that and get a custom result in case of not found. So for example, I can go here and add a comma after this return array. And then I could say, what should happen if there's no match found? So maybe when there's no match, I want the price to be zero. Then I can just type zero for this. Now again, that will only update for this first formula. And in my first formula, there is a match. But if I drag this down to update the rest, you'll see that this one returns a zero. Now, the reason I get a dash here instead of a zero is because of accounting formatting here. Accounting format shows zeros as dash. Now, if I switch this to any other format like currency, see it's gonna be zero, or best to just remove that formatting general so you can see actually what happens. So as you can see, the result is actually a zero. Now let's switch that to something else. Let's say you want to just say not found instead of having the zero. So I can go back here and instead of the zero, since not found is text, we will just put that in quotes like this. And now what's gonna happen, it's gonna return our prices, except that when there is no match, it's gonna say not found. So there it is. You could also just go back and just leave the text empty like this, double quotes. This way, if I drag it down, it will be an empty text here something sort of like a blank. So basically it doesn't matter, but this would be what to do in case this fails. This doesn't have to be just text or a number. This could also be another formula. So you could say, if I do an X lookup from that other tab and I don't find a match, maybe you could try a different X lookup in this position from a different source table. So doesn't really matter what this is in this position. It doesn't have to be just text or a number. It could be just another formula completely. In my case, I'm just gonna say not found. It should be good enough and drag it down. So, so far, everything we talked about is how our exact match XLOOKUP works. So now let's go to the next argument here after if not found, comma, and that would be the type of match. And the default here is exact match, which if we don't do anything, it is the same as doing zero, which is exact match. So if I change it to zero, we drag it down, we are going to get exactly the same results. No difference whatsoever. Now, other than exact match, if I erase this, we have three other types of matches. We have exact match or next smaller item, we have exact match or next larger item, and then finally we have the wildcard match. So let's see how those work. Now to explain you those, I'm actually not gonna do it here. Let's move to this maybe approximate tab. And right now, for example, if I enter 7,000 in the cell, and we go next to this and we do an X lookup, we could say search for this in this range, comma, and return, let's do category. So if I do this, hit enter, you'll see we get very good, which is the match for the 7,000. Now if I, for example, enter 6,800, there's no match in this column, so we get NA, that's the default behavior of our exact match. Now, let's go back, I'm gonna do a comma, and as if not found, I'm just gonna skip it for now, comma, and we got our next parameter here is the type of match. So I used to do zero, which was exact match. The next one is this one, 
exact match or next smaller number, which is our negative one type. So if I do this, double click on it or type negative one, the way this is going to work, see it returns above par. What's happening is that we don't have a match for 6,800, but the next smaller number for this is this 2,500. Therefore, we find this, the next smaller number being 2,500, and that returns above par. Now, in case you have an actual match, it will return the match. So if I do 7,000, it's still gonna be very good. But if I do something that does not match any particular number, like 6,999, then the next smaller number is this. So then it's above par. Now that's this negative one option. Now if I go back here, there's also positive one option, which is exact match or next larger number, like this. Which means in this case, there is no match for 6,999, so the next larger number is 7,000. Now, even if this was like 2,501, the next larger number is still 7,000. So therefore, this is very good. But if we do actually 2,500, again, it will return the actual number. So that's how this works. So we can do the next smaller number or the next larger number. So oftentimes, if you have some sort of categorization problem, you may want to do negative one option, which is the next smaller number, like this. And the reason this could be useful, let's say we have some sales, and we're trying to figure out how much commission you're gonna get based on your sales amount. So since I want to get commission, my return array will be commissions, like this. And then since I want to drag this formula down, I want to make sure my lookup array and return array are absolute reference. So I'm gonna do F4 to get my dollar signs like this, hit enter, and we're gonna drag this down. And what's gonna happen when we do have 2,500, it returns the commission matching that particular number. When we don't, like it's 6,800, essentially we end up having this range for us from 2,500 up to that 7,000, 7,000 not included. So in that case, 6,800 is still within this range and that's gonna be 120 commission. So the way essentially this is gonna work from zero to 999, we're zero commission, from 1,000 to 2,499, $50 commission, and it keeps going like this. And finally, the last line, anything 10,000 or higher is 600, which in this case is 12,000. If I do 10,000, it's still gonna say 600. But if I do 9,999, now we're in our previous range and that's 260. But essentially the next smaller number to this is the 7,000. So therefore we get that 260 and it works just fine. What's also interesting here is that if you're familiar with approximate match VLOOKUP, then you know that these have to be sorted in order for this to work. In XLOOKUP, it doesn't really matter. So we could move these things up and down in order. And now with all these positions shifted, if I just go here and make sure that I fix my formulas, and drag it down, you'll see that essentially it works the same way. So it's gonna try to find 2,500 in this. And if it finds it's a match, it's gonna return 120. Then here for 6,800, even though there is no match, it's gonna try to find the next smaller number. So the next smaller number in this, it's gonna be 2,500 which is gonna be this 120. Then we got this, the next smaller number for this is 7,000, so that's 260. Now if I update this to a higher number, then we end up being in this next smaller number being 10,000. So this still works, even though these results are not sorted. And then finally, if we try to enter a negative number, we're gonna get no match. 
because there's no negative 200 in this range and there's no smaller number than negative 200. So therefore, no match. So you could apply all of the same logic for the other type, the next larger number. So instead of looking for the next smaller number, it will look for the next larger number if there's no match. So essentially, you're gonna use these two types with numbers. When you do this exact match or next larger or smaller numbers, you're dealing with numbers generally, and you want to categorize your numbers in some sort of way. And that brings us to wildcard character match. And to explain you that, I'm gonna move to this first example. And just to refresh your memory, what I did here, I was searching for this product name in this column, and I was trying to find the matching price from this column. So now if I just update this to just new balance like this, if you remember, there is no match because it doesn't match what's in here. Now, if I try to do something like this, star, new balance, star, like this, there's no match because again, there is no star, new balance, star, product name here. We need to have an exact match. Now, this is where that wildcard match comes in. So I'm gonna do comma, I'm gonna skip this if not found, and for a match type, I'm gonna do wildcard character match, which is two type, like this. And if I'd enter, see, I was able to find a match for this because with wildcards, we can actually use star and question marks as wildcard characters. So star means zero or more characters. So essentially, when I put a star here, I'm saying before the word new balance, there could be more characters, but it's also possible there could be no characters at all. And then the same way here, we're saying zero or more possible characters could be on this side. So again, because our lookups will only find the first match, it's gonna find this first new balance as a match, and therefore it's gonna return the price for that. Now, if I just update this to Adidas, then it's gonna find the first Adidas, right? So the first one it can find up here that will match this criteria. So you could also do stars from one side like this. So this basically means it has to start with Adidas, but you're saying there could be more characters after the word Adidas. And this works just fine, as you can see, because this starts with Adidas. But if I try to, for example, enter balance like this, there is no match because nothing here starts with balance. But if I do another star, this would mean contains balance, which would work because we have this that contains the word balance, so that's gonna work. So these stars can go in different positions. You can do them just in the beginning, just in the end. You could also have them in the middle, like this. And that would work too. So now I'm saying there could be some characters then there's gonna be BA, and then there could be more characters here, and then there's gonna be CE, and then there could be more characters after that. So that's how this works. So star means basically zero or more characters in that position, and it could be any character. And then we have the question mark as another wildcard. So to show you how the question mark works, let's actually just enter one of these. So question mark means one character. So for example, if I enter like this, a question mark, that would be a match. See, Adidas running shoes, it's a match because we're saying there is a character A and then there must be one character after that. We don't care what that character is, but there must be one character after A. And then there is I after that. So therefore Adidas will match but if this was Anitas, that would also match because the second character here is a match for the question mark. It can be any character. However, if I had two characters here, that wouldn't match because we said after A, there is one character and then after that character, there should be an I, but we don't have an I. The next character we got is an N. 
And that would be your wildcard matches. So you can use question marks or stars to do wildcard matches. So a possible use case for this, let's say I want to be able to just type Adidas here and I want to be able to find the first thing that contains the word Adidas, which would be this one. Now, again, the way I would do that with a wildcard, usually I need a star here or a star here. But let's say I don't want to put those stars there. So what I could do, I could just create those stars by simply concatenating those in my formula. So I can add a star and concatenate it to my lookup value and then concatenate it with another star. And now here I'm building star and then whatever the word is here, which is Adidas, and then we put another star after this. And since we're doing wildcard match, now it should treat those stars as special characters. And therefore that should return the first Adidas we have here. And now if I just do Tommy, it will return the first Tommy in that particular range. And it keeps going like that. So it works just fine. And if we had the exact same thing, like if I type Adidas running shoes, it will still match it because stars also mean zero characters, no characters at all. And that would be a formula with a wildcard type match using XLOOKUP. So that covers match mode. And again, all of these works exactly the same way in Google Sheets, right? Excel, Google Sheets, XLOOKUP, it's the same function. So if I copy this, go to this and just find here, paste that same formula the same way. See, we find 9247. Now that's when there's nothing here. So if I clear this, it's also 9247 because by doing this, character matches like this with stars, we basically said, any characters could be here, any characters could be here. If this is a blank, then we're saying literally whatever you have is a match, any characters, which will get us the first match. So we may want to do some sort of if statement to handle this case when the product name is empty. But for now, let's just go back and just make sure this works. So if I enter Adidas, as you can see, that returns the first partial match to this. If I do Tommy, it will return the first partial match to this, no problem, works exactly the same way. And if I erase this, it's going to return the first thing that has anything in it, which is this one, basically. It's a match because it's a star character. And to handle something like this, we could add an if statement. So we could say if this equals blank, like this, if that cell value equals blank, then let's return blank. And then all the other cases, let's actually do an X lookup and find a match like this. And if I hit enter, that should now not return anything. And if I do something like Adidas, it will return the first possible partial match we get from this column. And otherwise it's empty. So finally, let's move on to our last argument here, which is your search mode which is the part we haven't talked about yet. So for that, I'm gonna move to Excel because it's easier to zoom in and zoom out for me here. And let's just grab this new balance running shoes and paste it down here. And let's just modify our match type to just be a regular type of match, which is like an exact match like this. So we got our return array we don't need wild cards anymore like this. This is our regular lookup. So I'm gonna do a comma, if not found, I'm gonna skip that for exact match. I guess we'll do exact match, that's fine, comma. Now this brings us to the last argument, which is search mode. So the search mode, you have four modes. We have first to last, last to first, binary search sorted ascending, and binary search sorted descending. Now our default is first to last. So one is the default behavior, meaning if I'd enter, since we have two New Balance running shoes here, 
We're going to search this from the top, find the first one, this one, and therefore return the price for that, 148.97. Now, if I switch that one to last to first, which is negative one, then basically we do bottom up search. So we're going to start searching from here and we're going to go up until we find our match. Therefore, our match is going to be this one, which is going to return 164.65. So instead of our default search, which goes up down, now we can do bottom up search. So you reverse the search order by doing this. And then we have binary options. So the binary search is basically going to assume that this column is sorted, alphabetically sorted or numerically sorted. So basically, first one is ascending sorted from lowest to highest or from A to Z. And the second one is descending sorted, which is Z to A or highest number to lowest number. And the purpose for this would be to get performance increase because with binary search, we can actually find the match faster when we're dealing with a large list. So what does that actually mean? So let's actually go to this approximate match for a second, this one. And I'm going to go ahead and remember how I said when we do that next larger number or next smaller number, sorting order here doesn't matter. Well, now it is going to matter. So I'm going to go ahead and sort this like this. Now it's going smallest to largest in this column. So therefore, if we do a lookup like this, now I'm going to switch this. Let's change the match mode to exact, comma, and then we're going to do search binary sorted. So that's going to be two option. And that's going to return 120. So now we're relying on the fact that this column is sorted from lowest to highest. And based on that, we're going to find the match. Now, why is it faster to search when the column is sorted? So for example, if we assume that our data is sorted, if I just go here on the right, let's say we have some numbers. If we have some numbers in some random order without having any of those sorted, if I wanted to find a number in this list, then what I would have to do, let's say we're searching for number five. What I would have to do, I would have to go through each one of these items until I find five. So imagine if we have a list of million items and that five ends up being the last item in a list, then I have to go through every possible item in a list and check if it's a five. And then once I get to the last one, I'll find, oh, there it is. That's the five. But to do this, I would have to go through 1 million lines in my data. So to find this five, I have to go from the top here, keep going until I hit the five, and then I found the item. And again, if that five ends up being the last item like this, then we have to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight steps to find the five. Now with binary search, if we sort this list, if we just assume that this list is sorted, we don't really have to go through every item to find our match. What we can do, we can just take this list, break it down into halves, and then search some number in the middle. Like in this case, we don't have an actual middle number, so we'll grab maybe the next one up or next one down, it doesn't matter. Let's go like next one up. So if we break this down in two, and we're searching for number five, we're going to check, okay, so this number that we got for this list, is it bigger than that five we're looking for, or is it smaller than the five we're looking for? Now, if we find this number is bigger, like in this case, this nine, we don't really have to check the rest of these items because we know this is sorted. So now we can go in this list and we can break that list down into two different parts. And again, we can now grab this part of this one half of that and check, is that number, again, do that same rule. Is it that number or is that number smaller or larger than the number we're looking for? So this way we can get to that number in less steps. Like giving this particular example with a five, 
if I was always checking the higher portion of the list first, if I break this down into two, check this higher number, that would not be this one. Then we would take this, break it down to two, and we would check this. We would find it's this number in two steps instead of going nine steps. If you apply this to a very large list with millions of items, the number of steps you need to do to get to the number are a lot less than if you had to just go and check each item. So that would be the benefit of doing something like this. But that also means you have to ensure that wherever you're searching, this is sorted. Now I did another video where I actually tested how much increase you get from this binary search. If you want, you can watch that video. And to be honest with you, the benefit of increase wasn't enough for me to justify using this, but to each their own. So just know the idea would be you could do a binary search and theoretically it should reduce the time it takes to search your item. So if you're dealing with very large data sets, this may be something you might want to look into. And this is pretty much how XLOOKUP works. So that's a lot of different examples and basically shows all the possible things you would do with this function. Now, finally, let me cover the part that this function is called XLOOKUP instead of V stands for vertical lookup when you do a VLOOKUP function. XLOOKUP, we can do basically both ways. We can do vertical search and we can do horizontal search. So, so far, all these examples I did used to be vertical searches. Why? Because our data is located like this. We have a column of values with search in that column, which is vertical column. If your data was positioned in a different way, so let's say you have this, let me just do transpose paste. So our data is like this. And now everything is going the other direction. So let's say I'm trying to find matching cost for this particular stock number. So the way we would do something like this is again using XLOOKUP. So I'm gonna point to this stock number. I'm trying to find that, comma. Lookup array is gonna be now this row where all the stock numbers are, comma. And our return array will be this. And if I close parentheses, this should work exactly the same way. So even though our data is not vertical, we can still do this. We can search in this row of items and we'll find our item in this position and then we'll return the values from this position from this range, which is 3514. So you can see it works just fine. And again, if you wanted to select this as return array, that would automatically produce both of those results. So basically we found the position over here and in this column, we got 7190 and 3514. So we return those values. If you want to switch the way these results are outputted on the screen, you can always use something like transpose function so that it returns those values this way instead of returning them this way. It's up to you. Then this would be price. This would be cost. Everything else works exactly the same way. Just know you can use in both directions. What is interesting about XLOOKUP, however, is that you cannot have one range being a column, the other range being a row. So what I mean by that, if I, for example, had this over here, like this, and I wanted to get my matching price for this by searching this column and then getting my results from this row, which is something you could do using index and match because it's basically just a position, right? So we're searching in this and we need to get it from the same position. We found the match. So as you can see, that doesn't work because this is vertical, this is horizontal. So we get a value error. We should be able to fix this problem, however, by transposing one of these. So if I do transpose so that it converts that row to a column, then we do get a match. So just know that it expects both of them to be 
either vertical or both to be horizontal. And if they're not, you have to convert one of them to match the other. So in this case, I did transpose to match the second one, which was horizontal, to be a vertical for my XLOOKUP to actually perform the way it should. And that should do it for XLOOKUP. Again, you can use all of this in Excel. You can use all of this in Google Sheets. Works exactly the same way. And it's basically simplified version of doing something that you would do before using a VLOOKUP. Let me know if you have any questions related to XLOOKUP, some particular things you would want to do using XLOOKUP. Just add it to comments and I'll try to do some videos on those topics. Other than that, that should do it. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.